to read you a poem that I've recently written called Trust. I'm also going to introduce you to my new instrument, the Reverie Harp. 
So I'm going to be using this um, just as a little backing to the reading. Trust. Being held in the arms of your mother. Baby trust. Holding the hands of mother and father. Walking still a challenging adventure. Toddler trust. Body moving and growing. Movement trust. Then changes. Dangers, fears, insecurities taking root in mind, teenage doubts permeating, simple trust. Trust assumed to be a state and disappointment, as if something foundational started giving way beneath you. Growing awareness of your vulnerability, impermanence, Fragility, disease, injury, war, age. Grieving for trust, the state of trust, lost. Grief, anger, suspicion, anxiety. And where is trust? The state of trust has vanished. Now begins the gradual discovery of the discipline of trust, the practice of trust, the slow dawning realization that the only sense of security possible is finding an ongoing relationship to the mystery of life. Sending the essence of love flowing through all life's aspects beautiful and seeming ugly, learning to lean on this relationship without expectation. Practicing the discipline of trust involves learning to accept all that happens in life as part of life and ultimately worthwhile experiencing to uncover what is lasting, what is real, in the ever-changing manifestations of life. The certainty of awakened hearts, recognition of the beloved, the sacred relationship that underpins, permeates, flows through all creation, infinite and one at the same time. The beloved companion, one's own self, lord of all hearts and one's own heart, separate and yet not. Words cannot encompass it. This trust is deeper than words can plumb. Like all disciplines, like all art, it is better to practice than to preach. Avatar Meha Baba Ki Jai. <laughs> A journey in life with the beloved. Wonderful, wonderful are the countless episodes in the life of the Avatar. Endless springs of light and fragrance. And wonderful the countless incidents of sacrifice and love undertaken by his lovers. According to the period and circumstances, the lovers of God are proved on a battlefield, sometimes a real battlefield, handful against hordes. Sometimes, as in this advent, proved in their willingness to sacrifice a life of worldly intoxication for a life in pursuit of love and truth and of service in his cause. 
Beautiful indeed are the stories of love that arise during the life of the, of the avatar. Stories made more poignant in that he, as author, is present to witness and praise his own awakening in the hearts of his lovers. Two such episodes were the visits of Maya Baba to Australia. He came in 1956 and 1958 for five days on each occasion, but in his own inexplicable way, he had laid cables to Australia through his disciples in the 1930s. And when an Australian in 1954 asked him to come, Maya Baba said, do you think I'm not already there? Physically, he came twice, quietly, seeking no publicity and saying to the handful of Australians who bowed their heads before his divinity, I have come to sow the seed of love in your hearts so that in spite of all superficial diversity, which you in your life in illusion must experience and endure, the feeling of oneness through love is brought about amongst all nations, creeds, sects and castes of the world. Maya Baba's first visit to Australia in 1956 seemed in retrospect a preparation for his second and last visit in 1958. He was in 1956 more often informal and gently mischievous. He played marbles with the older boys and simple ball games and sleight of hand tricks with the younger children. He took us to the movies, even though we only stayed some 20 or so minutes, and his discourses were punctuated with delightful mime and down-to-earth examples from everyday life. It was as though he took note of our immaturity and became the gentle moon to our seeking hearts. But in 1958, he became the sun to that germinating seed of love and brought home to us that love for him was obeying him and pleasing him in the manner of our life. June 1958, Avatar, Maya Baba and four disciples arrived at Sydney Airport on June 2nd and was then escorted to Brisbane Airport, Queensland. It was late evening when the plane landed and the still cool evening seemed like the hush before the, ma the master singer makes his appearance on the stage. Hmm. All that had to be done was done and the audience would receive according to their preparedness. Barbara descended and walked slowly across the tarmac, steadied by the ever near, ever watchful erich. Even though the dim light, even through the dim light, the mind was immediately aware of an immensity of suffering beyond reasoning comprehension. Again and again throughout the following days, the mind was thus confronted and momentarily stilled by awareness of Baba, of beloved Baba's suffering. He once said, as the breath ebbs and flows, but is always with you, so is my suffering always with me. Is not the suffering of the avatar in order that all beings and things may awaken to the realisation of their true state. Baba said, this gathering will be unique in the sense that you will witness and share my present universal suffering by being near me as my fortunate companions. Being with the Ancient One, 
who will be at the same time on the human level with you. We did witness his suffering. We were there and surely we felt it. And perhaps for a moment we understood the cry of the lover of God. I cannot, I cannot stand the pain of longing for you, beloved. Yet do not take it away because it is my very life. Sometimes he was certainly stern and almost fierce. And coupled with the sense of his suffering, his presence was like a hammer blow upon our complacency and insensitivity. But of course he knew precisely our capacity for change and acceptance and never took us beyond and never took us near the limits of our endurance. We recall that first meeting for all of us on the property which he had named Avatar's abode. We stood as he was carried in his chair to the platform and we sat as he gestured for us to do so. There was a pause with beloved Barbara looking at us and in that timeless moment we were caught and riveted anew in the wondrous beauty, strength and purpose of his face. In retrospect, it felt as though this was the defining moment of his second coming to this part of his world. He had endured the exhausting journey in the sight to the southern hemisphere with a body broken in health after two car accidents and by already 38 years of constant crucifixion in absorbing some of the world's karma. Yet, in his compassion and love, he had come for this handful of souls and for Australia. He said to us, I am the ocean of love. Drink deep at that fountain. Love has no limit, but mind is in the way, and mind cannot be annihilated by mind. Only by loving me as I ought to be loved can the mind be destroyed. If you love me with all your heart, you'll be made free eternally. There can be no compromise. One cannot love the world and love God. The man of the world has to compromise, but to have obedience to Baba, one cannot compromise with the ways of the world. Love me and obey me, and you will find me. I am the Ancient One, the One residing in every heart. Therefore, love others, make others happy, serve others, even at discomfort to yourself. This is to love me. Well, at times during those days in June 1958, we sought to entertain our beloved Baba, to ease for a moment the burden of his suffering and universal work. And now over the succeeding years, we come again in June to strengthen our hands for his work and to joyfully sing and play for his pleasure. And we feel that through the, the vibrant, potent silence of his presence on his abode. He answers, go on singing through your voices and your hands and take the blessing which I continually pour upon you through that singing and share it with others. I continually bring the greatest treasure which it is possible for man to receive, a treasure which includes all other treasures which will endure forever, which increases when shared with others, my love. Be ready, be always ready to receive it. 
What did we, the Australian Barber family, <coughs> do over the years to receive this treasure? Yes, <coughs> beloved Barber came to Australia twice and spent a little time with us. And yes, he put his hand on each of us so that we would never quite forget, nor ever be quite the same. And each would begin what to the mind is a journey, but to the heart is a gradual, timeless expansion of consciousness. But how were, we, were our lives spent? Who is this we that is spoken of and what did we do? Of course, the group of men and women who became in time the Barber family in Australia no doubt had many shades of motivation holding them to Barber. But for me, we tried. We tried. We served and we tried to serve. And we endeavoured to prepare ourselves to serve better. During those wonderful days of the 1970s, when money was even tighter than it is now, we all joyfully came to the abode and worked to clear the land and at least make more presentable the overgrown old pineapple farm the abode used to be. We never, we never thought of payment. We did not ask to whom the land belonged. We did not question why we were doing such work. And we did not feel any possessiveness after completion of the work. If questioned, we said that this land and house is his abode. And remembering the general joy of those days, I can only say we simply delighted in serving him any way we could. It was as if the wave of his awakening love in our hearts had washed over the dry, the dry sands of our sanskaras and they were momentarily submerged. It was a honeymoon period in this life, an encouraging glimpse of what can be done, what can be during that eternal love affair with the Divine Beloved. We are reminded of Baba's words, remember me. Why? Not because I will solve your problems or change your destiny, but because I will give you the strength to fight the battle of life. Such words give, such, give much courage for this holy war. Beloved Baba has said that he will remain with us for 100 years as though he was still in the body. And because we therefore feel his presence, albeit unseen, we, not, we tend not to feel the separation. But as he recedes further into himself, we will feel the separation more and more intensely. Then will be the time when people will flock to his abode, anxious to experience his presence and prepared to worship every grain of soil that his feet have touched. It could be said that the whole world is his home and in that home are many rooms. They are all his, but some places are more dear to him than others. And so and those contain more of his presence and perfume. We also took to heart Erich's words. As he spoke from the depth of his great love for beloved Baba about gatherings in his name. All that is needed is to just keep his presence at the time you are gathered. You gather not for your own sake, but for him, to love him, to pour out your love for him, to worship him, to adore him, and to devote all your heart feelings to him. Music can be used to entertain him. Let there be stories told about Baba and readings from printed material. Above all, 
bring his personality and his being to your minds and hearts and feel deeply his presence. Jay Baba. Jay Baba, happy Avatar's abode, 62nd anniversary. I hear your footfall, but they tell me that it's no longer audible. I did, I heard your footfall. I hear your bell like laughter, but they tell me that it's no longer here. Oh, but Mara, I did, I heard your laughter. Colors are gone, oh, but there are. I did, I heard your bangles. Those memories, no time span ever can erase. Your beauty, devotion, nothing can replace, nothing will erase, nothing can replace. Nothing will erase. I hear your footfall, but they tell me that it's no longer audible. Oh, but Mara, I did. I heard your footfall. Those memories, no time span ever can erase. Puzzle 98 from Indust I Sing by Francis Brabazon, melody by Sam Saunders, When Dawn Tended the Rose Garden. <laughs> I passed along Love Street and heard a distraught one sigh, though your house is in this street. I am far from your door, for my tears have become an ocean that has no shore. What strange tune is this, beloved? In what Like a derelict ship. Then the wind blew your hair across the sky. Black night fell on the tossed waters and covered the moon from sight. was a star came out ah but it was your tear it hummed it burned 
through the night it took away all fear i would leave this raft and i'd swim back to you but alas now that the daylight has come the waters are a broken Jay Baba, everybody. Um, it's so nice to be able to present something at the anniversary at Avatar's Abode, even though we can't be there. The topic I want to talk about today is Francis as a disciple poet. And as I started to get my thoughts together on this, the larger question came up of how do we actually present things on Baba when we gather together? With this new avatar, with a new advent, it presumes a new approach. Um, and um, this is a, a learning curve. How do we go about doing this? I think the answer for me, anyway, is embedded in Erich's question. He said that when Baba lovers come together in his name, the one question they should be sharing between each other is how do you keep the beloved present in your life? How do you remember him? Erich's question is not how do we as a group keep Baba present in our lives, but how do we singly as individuals keep Baba present? If we go down the track of how do we as a group, then we're going down the track of eventually formulating some sort of dogma and some sort of ritual, things which Baba didn't promote. Um, and basically uh, sort of propagandizing Baba. But if we go down the track of how do you keep Baba present in your life, then this honors everyone's, the idea of Baba as the indweller in each Baba lover, in each person. It allows freedom and respect to be nourished and it leads down to art eventually, which is personal expression. When you look at the Mandali, they seemed highly individualistic. They were united in their love for Baba, but in their expression of that love and how they went about that, they're all very different. And Baba supported this in his own statements, I think. For instance, in his universal message, Baba said, The impact of my love will help every individual to break free himself from his bondage in his own way. And then in 55, in November 55, Baba said, whatever brings you nearer to the path and suits you best is best for you, provided you are able to put into practice wholeheartedly and in harmony with the natural bent of your mind. So that seemed to be um, affirming Baba's approach. And then in, in the same year, in 55, at the same gathering, Baba said, I want you to be your natural self, not a conforming self. Uh, putting aside all social niceties one usually assumes in social life. Even Francis, when he wrote Stay With God, in the preface of that book, he writes, What I have written may be of some value to others, but if not, not. That is their affair. He was not writing it to try and um, reach some sort of a dogma on how we should stay with God. So what follows here in this talk for me is just um, an expression of how I keep my beloved present. Um, it's intended to be more in the spirit of conversation, like in Baal's conversation. It is certainly not meant to be um, a statement coming from any sort of... Um, authority or anything like that. So let me begin this talk. So Francis from the beginning is a very interesting Mandali uh, for us Westerners. He's a Western poet, a writer, he's very widely read, and he left us his books which we can study and look at. And as a poet uh, who has a good eye for things and a way with language, 
he's our man on the ground, so to speak, at Meirazad, um, because he can express the experience of what it's like to be with Baba. And Francis does represent a type of Western person also, um, who has the same sort of tastes as his, which is a growing person, growing in numbers. You know, he likes art, he likes Eastern philosophy, he likes truth, um, and he's a thinker. So he's a type which appeals to a lot of people. And I think that um, Baba used Francis. Baba said that I have come to revitalize world religions and bring them together like beads on one string. I think Baba, through Francis, revitalized world art, or revitalized just art, and brought it back to what it should be. The spring of art had become sort of clogged up. And um, Francis really, th through, through Baba's help, helped to unclog that. But um, um, this wasn't easy for Francis. I think Baba prepared him for this. For instance, in 59, before he came to India, he had just had one poem published in the London magazine, which was a very fine literary magazine. He had one of his poems read, Death of the City, on the BBC Third Programme. He just had Baba praise, highly praise, stay with God. And so in his mind, he felt his career as a writer was really launching, launching off. He was, he was beginning. Things were finally coming together. And so when he arrived in India in 59, when summer approached, when Baba and all the Mandali went to Guru Prasad, Francis, which with Baba's approval, um, was to go and stay with Ramakrishna in the Pune Centre nearby Guru Prasad and cycle in each morning to see Baba. But what happened was every time he cycled in at a, at a set time by Baba, Baba said, I wanted you earlier and you're not here. I needed you now, Francis. You should come now at seven, not 7.30. And so it went on like this and Francis ended up turning up before six and still Baba is there before him. And this just got the better of Francis and he broke down and wept in front of Barbara and says, I cannot do this. And Barbara decided, well, Francis, you need to stay here at Guru Prasad near me. You need to be my disciple first, which is a person on call whenever I want them. And your writing as a poet is secondary. So I think for me, that was a turning point where Francis became a disciple poet. Even in later life, Francis, he told me once, that writing just was his pastime. He was there, really, on Baba's, as a disciple for Baba to follow him. In a way, instead of writing poems to Baba, Francis was writing now poems for Baba. So this idea of Francis as a disciple poet is something I wanted to explore. So Baba has said, um, to garland me, to bow down to me, to sing my praises are comparatively the three most unimportant things. The three most important things on the path to God realization are love, obedience, and surrender. There is no possibility of compromise about these things. From that, um, and going back to this idea of what does this avatar want? What are we, what's this, the new ball game we're in now? I think Baba doesn't want an art of garlanding him, singing his praises and bowing down to him. He wants an art of love, obedience and surrender, which is an art of a disciple poet. Um, it's interesting, the acronym of love, obedience and surrender comes to loss. Um, so the artist on the page or on the, on the canvas is really in the act of expressing love for Baba, is losing themselves in this act. So that art of love, obedience and surrender is really the art, I think, is what the art which Francis is opening up as a disciple poet. In 1956, Francis wrote this statement, in one of the first books he published, Seven Stars to Morning, and it comes out of 
a long statement, like a manifesto, his artistic manifesto, and it was entitled Art as a Practice of Devotion. And Francis said this, Art is a method of practicing devotion to the true teacher, who is a supreme artist, the whole universe being his creation and man his most finished work. To every artist, sorry, to this artist, every true artist has ever bowed, knowing that without his help, he is helpless. Without his inspiration, he is void of all creativeness. I think Francis has stayed pretty true to that. Um, and that's really the statement of a disciple poet, a disciple artist. But this is not an easy task. Any, nothing with Barbara is an easy task. We're opening new ground here. In 59, in that poem which he had published in the London magazine, Francis writes, It takes much patience, sorry, it takes much patient labour to polish a piece of glass, to catch the light of a star. It takes more to polish your heart till it reflects the light of God. It takes time to fix the image of yourself on a piece of canvas. It takes more to paint the image of the beloved in your own flesh. So this is a statement again, I think, of, of the role of the disciple poet that it takes much more to be a disciple poet because you have to, as Francis says here, um, polish your heart till it reflects the light of God. Um, on this same theme, at the end of Stay With God, in a section he calls The Coda, Francis writes, and this encapsulates this whole idea once more, the real art of men is modelling their flesh upon the pattern of his manhood, of the avatar. I'll read that again. The real art of men is modelling their flesh upon the pattern of his manhood, dreaming his loveliness and truth, and delineating in works and work the dreamed image of his reality. The first part there, the modelling the, uh, the modeling their flesh upon the pattern. This is the act, I think, of the disciple, where you just want to be shaped and formed uh, in whatever Baba wants. The delineating, delineating in works and work, the dream image, is the act of the poet. I think this idea of the disciple poet is very direct, very individual, very heart-centered, and very barber centered um, In a later work, Word at World's End, Francis really defines this position finally. It's in the preface of that book. He says that most writers, and he's writing this in 1971, whether avant-garde or pop, only have to satisfy a public which has been carefully conditioned by every gimmick the genius of publicity can invent. But for years now, I have had to satisfy God, and not the God who was dead or who changes his face according to theological expediency and political necessity, but the God who is the God-man, the beautiful person who was the beloved of all, who does not live for bread alone, who was so alive that all other persons are shadows emerging from the limbo of consciousness for a moment of a gesture or cry. So here again, Francis is acknowledging, this is my inspiration. This is beyond being my muse. I am the disciple poet of a living God-man. But then Erich says, Although Mayor Barber's physical presence is not now available, his divine presence as the eternal beloved is always available for every heart that yearns for him. So we have access if our heart yearns for him. Francis had Barber's physical presence, but not all the time. In the act of writing, 
Francis had to contact Barber inwardly to find his inspiration, um, to get that connection with Barber. How did this happen as a disciple poet? During Barber's, or oh, sorry, during Francis's second um, meeting with Barber, and this was during the Under Tour in 1954, Francis talks of that experience, and he says, <clears throat> "No man or woman, no flight or thought, no aesthetic experience, no sublimity of nature, has touched the depths of me as this man has. I have met no one, or experienced no experience." which has melted my heart or sharpened my intellect as he has. So this idea of this experience of Baba really entering into his being and um, completely going to the depths of him as nothing else has. In night is, a, is, is, a, is, a, is a, an interesting phenomenon to talk to think about. Um, and I'm sure it's the same sort of thing we've all had in our experience of Barber. In 1956, following that tour, two years later, Barber came to Australia, and to celebrate that, Francis wrote this pamphlet, which is a wonderful pamphlet. It's called The Birth of the Nation. In this, Francis refers to Barber as Mayor Barber, coming in human form to Australia. But he also refers to him as this image of reality and love, image with a capital I, and suggests that during Baba's stay, while other people are there with him seeing Baba, that Baba was imprinting into their hearts of those present this image of reality and love. And um, I think this is exactly what Francis experienced on Andra, or in during the Andra tour also. There's, there's some imprinting that goes on when people are around Baba. And that is still available to us. As Erich said, that the divine presence of the eternal beloved is still with us um, for every heart that yearns for him. And this image of Baba, of reality and love, I want to explore that a bit more. Um, but this image, uh, for this to happen, this imprinting to happen, naturally one has to be open and receptive. And I would think also obedient. Um, there's a Christian monk, David Steidel Rast, and he says something about obedience, which I think is very apt for our discussion here. He said, obedience in the full sense is the process of attuning the heart to a simple call contained in the complexity of a given situation. The attuning the heart is a critical part there. The only alternative is absurdity. Absurdus literally means absolutely deaf. Obedience means listening with an attuned heart. To live a life without listening is to live an unnatural life, an absurd life. And so putting those sort of things together, I think that um, for us living in this advent now where Baba is able to be contacted, that we have, so listening with an obedient heart, with an awakened heart, is what Francis did. He was able to listen very, very finely to Baba's voice, put it that way, within him. And Baba said that obedience is his gift from master to man. That's what he gave. That's what he gives. And he said his main um, uh, discourse was that I have come not to teach, but to awaken, to awaken these hearts to obedience, to listening. And out of that, I think, um, a new art will come. It won't come from just painting pictures. It has to come from this depth of the heart. So the idea of um, this living image, it's a living image, imprinting ourselves in our hearts, this image of reality and love, is all through stay with God. 
Bob, Francis uses this, 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 this metaphor. I, I counted about 30 times, and there's more of it. It's the way he, he unpacks this idea. And, of course, this idea of image and likeness. Now, he brings in the idea of likeness here. The image and likeness goes back to the Judaic Christian tradition that God made us in his image and likeness. And this is a, the point, the uh, thing which Francis picks up on. Um, there's Baba's image, which is just creative um, power. It's not just an image of a, a static being. It's a creative power, an impulsive um, uh, wanting to create power and that is the image and the likeness is what when individual people express out of that likeness which is reflected in their hearts so the image is one but the likeness is infinite um, Francis expression is a particular aspect of that infinity of that of it likeness in him uh, here again, that goes back to our theme that we have to be, at the beginning, have to be individual before uh, and not be a conforming lot of Bible lovers. But how do you get to this point? Francis even elaborates a bit further on that. And he says that, um, and this is very traditional also, that you have to get rid of all these foreign images and stuff in your heart. The way he puts it is, that um, that we need to sweep away the rubbish of self-expression, eliminate all the nonsense of precious feelings and opinions of separatist personality, so that a likeness of this image can breathe in our hearts. So that this clearing out of all this other foreign images and so on and, and uh, phony likenesses. We have to come back to this, clear that out so this image can be reflected. That, again, is the task of a disciple poet. And once that, had, once that is done, of course, this whole process feeds the artist and it feeds the viewer of the artwork. And I think as Baba people, um, how do you keep, getting back to Erich's question, how do you keep the beloved present in your life, is you reveal your heart. You reveal... Uh, your what the likeness in your heart which this image of reality and love has engendered and when we share that we are literally sharing Baba um, just a few finishing now on this a few thoughts on entertainment um, Baba's only real enjoyment is to see his likeness in creation, to see his likeness mirrored in us, see the variations of his inf infinite majesty reflected in us. In Stay With God, there's a beautiful passage um, which Francis encapsulates this idea. Francis says, This delightful and frequent recurrence of God's pleasure in knowing himself this well-pleasedness with himself, the perfect vanity of his, is one of the amazements of his lovers, and is the cause of their tears of joy and impossible sighs. For the lover is in love with the beauty of the beloved, and the essence of his beauty is his vanity, and all else but his beauty is vain. So here is Baba, who is all, all in all. What can art do? What can any of us do but entertain him? That's the only role we have. He, he is all knowledge, all power, all bliss. He is everything. We are left with the, only the task to entertain him. Um, Francis picks up on this idea. He said, to entertain the beloved is the only valid reason, the only valid reason for a poem. Um, to entertain is what Baba asked to be at Avatar's abode. He wished to be entertained. Um, art, which is seen as entertainment, is always seen as low-grade. But to Baba has resurrected that word. 
Baba has given that word life a new meaning for us as Baba lovers, I think. To entertain him acknowledges that he is in the audience, that he is there sitting amongst us. Um, you don't then contemplate de what is there. What's, first and foremost, Baba's presence is there. Um, so the opportunity then is, as I said, is for how do we share each other, how do we share Baba amongst each other, is this way of, of art which is shaped from the heart of individual Baba lovers and, um, and shared amongst us. And in that way, Baba is not only present, but is sustaining of us. J Baba.
Assurance of our 